I'm here to command this gun. That's much Absolutely. better. Absolutely. More yes. power up here. So here you will see. And take those while.
Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the big debate and what the new London plan means for Londoners. I'm uh, Peter Murray. I'm chairman of New London Architecture and of the London Society, and I'll be moderating this first session of the evening's big debate, and uh, the following two sessions will be hosted by directors of our partners, uh, Lisa Taylor uh, of Future of London and Tony Travers from LSE. Um, now, as many of you here probably uh, remember, last year uh, we held, together with other key London organisations, a uh, big debate uh, with uh, the 1,000 people or so here and many others uh, streaming uh, on the internet and to discuss what kind of future we wanted to create for London. The Mayor had just published uh, the document entitled A City for All Londoners, and uh, he was encouraging Londoners to provide feedback on key policies they wish to see in the new London plan on topics such as planning, housing, transport and environment. Uh, following the success of last year's big debate, we're now hosting another one, uh, this time to discuss the new draft London plan, which was published a couple of months ago and is now uh, under consultation until the 2nd of March uh, uh, this year. Uh, so we hope this debate will encourage everyone to reflect on the new plan. Um, of course, uh, everyone can submit a comment uh, on it uh, on the GLA website, and uh, we hope everyone will, and will be able to do so fully informed by uh, the debate this evening. So uh, we've got three panels uh, discussing slightly different topics uh, under the uh, plan, and uh, uh, we have a key speaker, and uh, uh, then uh, there will be panellists who will discuss the topics under review. And uh, you, of course, uh, will be able to vote, as uh, hopefully many of you have. I hope you've all uh, managed to uh, get onto the uh, Slider uh, website. Uh, if you haven't managed to do it yet, uh, all the information is on the front of the leaflet that you have uh, before you. And... Uh, we'll be uh, going through uh, some uh, of the uh, first uh, votes in, in a moment. But uh, before that, I'd like to um, thank uh, our uh, champions uh, for uh, this evening, British Land, supporting the event, and program supporters, ACOM, uh, BECG, and Gensler, and also uh, the other uh, London organizations who have worked together with us to bring together this amazing audience to discuss the plan, and it's one of the great things about London. We have an amazing body of organizations which deliver uh, debate and discussion about the built environment to a very high quality. And uh, we're filming and live streaming the event to widen the audience. Uh, camera's up there and a couple of others around here, so uh, uh, if you ask a question, uh, you'll be seen by a couple of thousand other people, and uh, the people who are, are watching us will also be able to vote if they get onto the Slider uh, website. So we're going to have polls throughout the evening uh, to uh, record uh, uh, things as they go along, but we've got uh, a vote on the key topics, which have been up on the screen, uh, which uh, a vote now and a vote uh, when we finish to see if people's attitudes have changed throughout uh, the evening. So uh, I, I, I hope you're all now uh, logged in so you can vote. So we, we're just going to make sure uh, we have the final uh, votes in for the uh, first voting on uh, the initial questions, uh, which are uh, up on the screen. And uh, so uh, uh, you'll have about another 30 seconds or so to uh, complete uh, uh, the voting on each of these as I read them out. So the first one, question one, do you agree with the new London plan's focus on densifying the suburbs? N uh, yes, it is needed. Uh, we are to deliver more homes. No, it will have a bad impact on existing communities, infrastructure, and London's character. So uh, that's the first one. You've got 30 seconds just to uh, complete uh, your voting on that. And uh, the uh, percentages are coming up on the screen now. Well, that looks... Uh, Pretty convincing so far. You've got a few more seconds if anyone wants to change the vote. <laughs> right. Well, I think we can move on, really. That looks like a pretty convincing uh, vote in favour of uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, densifying the suburbs. So um, uh, we'll look forward to hearing what Andrew Boff has to say about that later. Um, question two, uh, will we realistically deliver 65,000 new homes a year within London's boundaries? Yes or no? So you've got 30 seconds to uh, complete your voting on Right. Anyone still voting to turn that one around? <laughs> Question three. So, do you think that the mayor can deliver the quantity of housing he needs without developing on the green belt? Sorry. We seem to be slightly out of sync on the questions on the screen. Do we, we need to go through these questions now, do we, Mark? Right, no, okay, we're fine now. Uh, right, do you think that the mayor can deliver the quantity of housing he needs without developing on the green belt, yes or no? You may vote. Right, well, that one looks slightly more um, even in the voting. No, it's changing. <laughs> I think we'll let this go for the first full 30 seconds, this one. Right, that seems to be uh, where it's going to stop. Okay, right, on to uh, the next one, question four. The mayor will work with the relevant wider southeast partners on strategic infrastructure and housing targets. Do you think this approach will be effective in providing affordable homes for Londoners? Yes or no? Thirty seconds. Right, well, that's a very positive response for uh, wider southeast consultation and uh, collaboration. Um, and now, uh, finally, question five Do you think population, London's population will continue to grow after Brexit? If, of course, we go through br with Brexit, if <laughs> Andrew Adonis has his way, but we shouldn't be voting on this, should we? Right, so there we are, positive uh, 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 vote on uh, London's uh, future growth uh, and uh, continuing growth. So uh, thank you all for that. We'll come back to those questions, I say, at the end of the evening just to see if uh, the uh, discussions have had any impact on your views. So uh, first of all, uh, we are going to talk about wider planning issues related to the London plan itself. And uh, we have Jules uh, Pipe, Deputy Mayor for Planning, who is going to uh, introduce that. But I'd just like to uh, introduce our uh, panel. Uh, we have Sadie Morgan, DRMM and Mayor's Design Advocate and uh, Infrastructure Commission. Uh, Yolanda Barnes, uh, who is uh, Director of World Research at Savills. Uh, Nicholas Boyce-Smith, Director of Create Streets. And Michael Meadows, Director of Planning at British Land. Uh, but, uh, Jules, if I could ask you to uh, make the opening statement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and I'm very pleased to kick uh, the evening off, uh, or the, the debating part of this evening, uh, on the new draft London plan. Um, I think we can all agree on the importance uh, of uh, the London plan, uh, demonstrated amply by the number of people in this uh, room here tonight. And on that, we've all been, all the panellists have been encouraged to be provocative 
Uh, so I'll start by saying four things that the London plan is not. It's not a war on the suburbs. It doesn't encourage garden grabbing. Greater density does not mean tall buildings or poor quality, and we're not seeking to preserve every last inch of industrial land, preserving it in aspic. It is instead, the London plan, uh, to be, it's intended to be a blueprint, a blueprint of how we can continue to succeed as a world city, facing up to the huge challenges that brings in terms of population and employment growth, which, whilst that's a sign of our city's success, it's also putting huge pressure on our land, our housing, our infrastructure and the environment. There needs to be greater investment in homes, schools, transport, and there needs to be more leadership about where that should happen. The effects of climate change are becoming ever more apparent. The need to tackle the capital's poisonous air quality is acute. And despite a growing economy, the benefits aren't shared. We've got growing inequality here in London, with some of the very richest and very poorest people living side by side. Health life expectancy differing by up to 19 years between boroughs. And the Mayor's new draft London plan addresses these challenges through what we call good growth. Growth that's economically and socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. It's the guiding principle for the plan, which has six cross-cutting good growth policies, focusing on a healthier, more efficient and more resilient city, where communities have access to the homes and the economic opportunities that they need to thrive and succeed. But what does good growth mean in practice? It means growing a city with more genuinely affordable homes for Londoners to buy and rent and it sets a strategic tar target for 50% of all new homes to be affordable. And it introduces a number of measures to incentivize this, which I'm sure James will speak about later. It means growing a greener city with healthy streets that supports Londoners' health and well-being through ambitious targets, like um, being a zero carbon city uh, by 2050, achieving a modal shift so that 80% of journeys are taken by cycling, walking, and public transport and ensuring at least there's 50% green cover across the city, and having stronger policies around improving air quality. It also means growing a more socially integrated city with public spaces that are welcoming and accessible to all Londoners with an emphasis on good design. It means growing a digitally connected city where digital infrastructure is treated as the fourth utility, where businesses can thrive and data helps us be more efficient and resilient. It means growing a more sustainable city making the best use of land through co-location, mixed-use developments, and ensuring that the transport, social, green, and other infrastructure is in place to support new developments. It also means growing a city with a vibrant cultural and heritage offer that engages communities, but also drives our creative and tourism industries. And most importantly, it means ensuring people have more of a say in the development of their city, so that growth brings out the best of places, while providing jobs and other opportunities for the communities that are already there. But unlike previous versions of the plan, this one goes beyond such statements of ambition. This document places a specific focus on tangible policies and planning issues. It provides greater clarity over how the plan will be implemented and where in London major development and infrastructure should be delivered, grouping 47 opportunity areas into nine growth corridors. And its delivery focus, supported for the first time by a detailed viability study, which assesses the impact of the proposed policies on London's future development. So by setting a new level of ambition for the people who make all of London's planning decisions, we believe that this London plan will create a better city for all Londoners. And I look forward to hearing your views tonight and working with you over the next year in how we can create a city that works better for everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jules. And now we're going to have responses from our panel. And I'd ask uh, Yolanda to uh, start off, please. Thank you. Well, uh, this is obviously a vast topic to uh, respond to in uh, just a few minutes. But um, there are two main points that I really want to make. Um, one is regarding the density matrix and uh, the uh, loosening, shall we say, of attention to, to that and um, then talking about how we grow the city generally. Um, and I suppose the, fir the first point is that, um, in my view, housing density is not a number. And this is a mantra which uh, some of you will be sick of hearing me say, but uh, 
we don't live in housing units, we live in neighborhoods, we live in places. And I think anything that moves away from trying to uh, reduce to a number the amount of housing uh, we need in uh, the spaces we need it uh, is probably a good thing. Having said that, the, um, the next point uh, really refers to the uh, very rightly uh, pointed out need for design scrutiny uh, where densities do go high to make sure that they are uh, livable and feasible. Um, my only point around that, my second point, is that just as housing density is not just a number, that good design isn't just architecture either. And what I mean by that is that we really need to pay attention to how we make places and <coughs> the quality of uh, streets in them. Now, as a world researcher, I felt that I had to uh, name drop some, somewhere else other, other than London. So I was in Berlin last week. And um, I think Berlin provides a very good illustration of what, what I mean by the quality of a street network and the quality of a place. Because um, I noticed, um, passing through the old checkpoint Charlie, that actually it's East Berlin now that's the really uh, cool, trendy, sort of hipster quarter of Berlin. And the thing you know about Berlin is that the success that it's having at the moment sure as hell isn't down to architecture. It's pretty ugly uh, stuff if you look at individual buildings. But what you do have is a really, really vibrant streetscape, which doesn't exist on the side of the wall that uh, enjoyed uh, late 20th century North American automobile orientated planning uh, types. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there for London that we actually need to pay very close attention to how we design our neighborhoods in the broader sense. In other words, pay attention to geography, not just the architecture. So I suppose my plea around uh, density would be not just to think about housing units, but to think about all the other stuff that people use on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And maybe uh, if we can find a, a, a <coughs> more user-friendly word for it, we should be talking about the intensity of development, not, not just house, housing densities. And we should also think about the sort of environments, the walkable, livable neighborhoods and streets uh, that we create in order to accommodate all of that. And that leads really to um, really thinking about how we use and reuse suburban land. And suburban, underused, underdensified, underintensified suburban land isn't just about existing housing stock, it's also about inappropriate, sort of large, big shed type retail and uh, industrial uses, which can be intensified. You know, we need to be thinking about uh, two-story uh, industrial factories, perhaps, or uh, certainly more innovative workspaces, and undoubtedly could be using land around these big sheds uh, for more housing. So that uh, really leads me to think uh, that if we are to move away from the bird's eye view pretty plans on sort of that, that work for drones but not for people on the ground, then we actually have to think about new mechanisms, new levers, new initiatives and strategies for actually implementing this change. And I think um, this is where planning and big London plans and the like can only go so far. Without initiatives to release land, to encourage people to uh, work on neighborhood plans together, and um, actually make these things happen, uh, it's not going to go very far. So I think um, a plan's a great start, but boy, we really need to rethink uh, some of the ways that uh, we develop, release land, and, um, and, and do things generally uh, in order to make it happen. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, can you give us a bit of a response how the development community uh, res responds to the plan? Yes, um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, George. Um, um, I've been asked to reflect on how the plan will affect developers. I don't think there's one single answer, but I hope this reflects the views of development colleagues I've spoken to, as well as some personal views. Firstly, I think we all share the Mayor's vision to deliver growth which is socially and economically inclusive, environmentally sustainable, and which puts health and well-being at the heart of planning. This informs much of our thinking, design, and community engagement at British Land. Taken individually, the policies in the plan are ambitious and at times highly imaginative. 
challenge for developers and the mayor will be to balance sometimes competing priorities and deliver consistently. The housing targets in the plan mean there will be pressure to densify suburbs and town centres beyond the boundaries of the cows and opportunity areas. This should not be seen as a soft option. Community engagement, investment and time on the part of developers and strong political leadership on the part of authorities will be required. If there is a primary policy or presumption even which runs through the plan and indeed the Mayor's manifesto, it's the delivery of affordable housing and the infrastructure required to enable it. The plan would benefit, in my view, from this being made clearer in policy terms up front. Current structure and prescriptive policies could create opportunities for objection and ultimately refusal. Some flexibility will be required for decision makers to apply policies to local circumstances. How is delivery of affordable <coughs> housing to be balanced against urban greening or delivery of affordable workspace or retail? The concept of urban greening is one we support, one which informs the design and landscaping of our developments across our campuses in London. But when combined with other policy requirements to increase density or provide public access to roofscapes, a specific urban greening factor may be hard to achieve. As always, much will come down to implementation, and in certain cases, intervention. By that, I mean the extent to which the Mayor is willing to call in schemes where objectors and planning committees use specific prescriptive policies in the plan to challenge rather than permit higher densities. The level of resource available to monitor the application of policies as they're carried forward in local plans will also be important. It's easy to see conflicts arising locally which could impact the speed and certainty of decision making in the short term, particularly as the tra plan travels through the draft stages. A clear policy hierarchy could help to address this. In conclusion, there is much to welcome in the plan, but there needs to be a recognition of the practical difficulties and policy choices facing planners and developers. This requires not rewriting of policies, but refining recalibrating and sometimes prioritizing to ensure sustained delivery and growth. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Sadie, perhaps you can tell us a bit about thinking about wider Southeast, uh, uh, which we've heard about already, and also infrastructure. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the, the invitation. I think that one of the most important things that we have to think about is that London can't do it on its own, and uh, the plan as I took home from my bedtime reading <laughs> over the last couple of uh, weeks is uh, quite, you know, it's ambitious. And, um, and I think that, you know, the, the reality is that the key London infrastructure projects are only actually going to happen if the government relentlessly pushes them forward. And um, uh, Crossrail 2, extending the Bakerloo line, the Eastern Crossings for the River Thames, you know, they're all absolutely essential. Uh, to, get, to make sure that we have sustained growth in, in, in London, and the UK needs London <laughs> to have sustained growth. Um, and I think that if you look at London, it's you know it really has uh, you know boasted some of the most highly successful major projects in recent years. The Olympic, the current Crossrail is extraordinary. I went down and looked at the tunnels. Uh, probably one of the highlights of last year. Um, but all too often the process of agreeing and delivering projects is characterised by delay, backtracking and instability. And I won't talk about Silvertown Tunnel now. Um, but, and we just can't allow that to continue. Uh, and I think particularly in the view of the inevitable uncertainty for international investors during the Brexit negotiations. Um, I was asked to highlight uh, one of the, uh, or, or a number of, of the points in in the plan, I, I'm not going to do that, but I think that this sort of sense of uh, making sure that government is committed and giving some certainty is absolutely essential. Um, and we need that because we have a funding gap uh, of around 3.1 billion pounds per annum. Uh, so I think it isn't just about money, it's, all about, it's also about good ideas and not necessarily more of the same. Um, 
I couldn't go without today with a little quote from Andrew, Lord Adonis, who said, new infrastructure is no more complete an answer to congestion than new hospitals are the complete answer to health. We need to better take care of what we have already, as well as building a new. Um, for a long time, I've been advocating uh, good design, but I, I also don't think design is about aesthetics. And lateral thinking, I think, is one of the things that architects do best. Um, as I reminded Sadiq uh, when he launched his Good Growth by Design agenda. Um, so if we need to think hard about problem solving, we need to do so in the light of huge t technological advances. Um, I think this may be our only get out of jail card. So strategic design, a combination of creative thinking, artificial intelligence and new technology, I think can help us reduce our consumption of natural resources, operate our transport more efficiently, charge fairly for those who pollute most and build quicker. Um, it is a difficult choice when it comes to dishing out the cash. Do you give more to those who su whose success empowers the economy or boost those who you may argue need it most? Um, I think London needs more autonomy. I think it, an uncontrained London is one that uh, will grow faster and better and more sustainably, and I think that will benefit the rest of the UK economy. Thank you, Sadie. I um, think that's three minutes. Uh, yeah, pretty spot on. Thank you. Uh, Nick Boyce-Smith, um, streets uh, feature pretty high on the agenda in the London plan, don't they? How, how do you respond to that? We're, we're, we're pro-streets and create streets, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> I do apologise, I've got a bit of a cough, so if I end up doing a Theresa May impersonation, um, Peter will no doubt give me my P45. Um, um, three or four just, just quick points. Um, first of all, the wider one, never, never forget how odd the British planning system is in historic and comparative terms. It's, it's a a policy-led system, whereas most world systems are a regulatory system. So there's, it, you can have a point of view on lots of things and give certainty on almost nothing, which is coming back to your point. Um, and the, the problem with having a plan that is 529 pages long, and, and here it is, um, is that if you have a perspective on everything um, but aren't giving certainty on things, it becomes easy to stay in the vicious circle that London is still in, and that's the vicious circle of high land prices, uncertainty on what will or won't get planning permission, bidding up to you know, higher prices, higher volumes built, lower affordable housing, lower design quality. So I think the key challenge, this isn't really praise criticism, the key challenge for the London plan is to fix down on some of these things. And I think there's some really important steps that have been taken in the right direction. So even before the London plan came out, the draft London plan, uh, you know, setting a fix for what proportion of affordable housing would be in there starts to set the land price. So I think what they need, I would argue, to do with a little bit more clarity than they are yet is to say, these are the things that really, really matter, and we're going to absolutely double down on these and fix these so the land price starts getting set. So that would be my first quick point. My second quick point, purely on streets, to, to Peter's question, as I'm sure you've all read, policy T2 is on healthy streets. It's a, it's a good set of policies. There's nothing to object into it. But there's one concern. I, I'm sure a few of you in the room will have seen uh, a planning application that argues that we should do this because it subscribes to the policy, and yet any a rational reading of the policy would say, well, no, it doesn't. Um, and I can think of one I've seen where it justified uh, a new development because it was creating new green space, which was technically true. There was a new bit of green space down at the bottom of the tower next to the big road, round the corner and down a bit, uh, which was clearly going to have no well-being utility for almost anyone, and yet it was justifiable because it sort of, sort of met the policy. So my concern on the healthy streets policies, which is a good set of policies, is that it's too much about... Um, uh, desired outcomes are not about outputs. So it doesn't specifically say there should be more street trees. And we know from the well-being research that street trees is an incredibly strong thing to, to link into uh, people walking more or, uh, or, or lower levels of stress. So I think uh, more certainty on what it means by, uh, by healthy streets. Just quickly also on good growth. The, the first chapter of the London plan is the good growth policies. Again, a very, very impressive and to be supported set of policies. But, but I think with one important, uh, hopefully constructive caveat, particularly Good Growth Policy 3, um, which talks about creating a healthy city, very strongly in favour of that, um, it makes all the case, and there's a strong case to be made, and rightfully you support it, uh, for densifying bits of London. But there's a trade-off in this. If you look at, and we have, if you look at the price elasticity data, 
actually, the thing that most consistently in most towns and most cities across the world people pay the most for is, is not uh, density, it's actually personal space. That's the thing that you can find in the pricing data the most. So there is a big upside to density, it's walkability. It's being able to get to your place of work or to shops or to schools by walking or by cycling, healthier transport. But there's also an upside to slightly lower uh, density, and there's certainly an upside to, to certain forms of urban form as opposed to the towers in the park model. And none of the evidence, I would argue, if you like, on the flip side on density, not against density, but that necessary tension between high density and a, a, and a walkable, enjoyable human form it is that. So again, I'd, I'd, I'd slightly urge perhaps a bit of rewriting of, of, of bits of the good growth policies, though being broadly supportive. And then the, the final point would be, I mean, look, we face, I think, despite possibly an easing of pressure due to Brexit, I think London faces its biggest housing and clean air challenge since the 19th century. And so the question, uh, this is an ambitious plan, and, and rightly so, but I think it, it needs to come alive not just for all of us in this room, who by definition are all probably a little bit weird if we wanted to come to this, and I mean that as a compliment, I, I choose to come, um, but actually to get it out into the, to the wider public. So my question, I really, for, for, the, for the, the two deputy mayors and for the mayor is, what would Basil Jed do? How do we bring this to life? How do we make it really big? And they, I think there's a series of steps, community codes for the design codes that they're rightly proposing, uh, more of a commitment to co-design, not consultation, which I think is now forced, rightly so, by the new policy on estate regeneration. Um, I'd say banning non-electric private traffic into zones one and half of zone two for other than a few times of the day. I'd say trams into central London. I'd say a series of Thames towns linking the Elizabeth line with a popular medium density, or high density, but medium rise uh, set of form. Uh, um, uh, Thames towns in the, sorry, Thames towns in the, in, in Thames Estuary, Elizabeth towns along the Elizabeth line. And I'd say on the healthy streets to create boulevards where we intensify and make more beautiful uh, L London's primary and arterial roads to increase density, increase beauty, and increase uh, healthy transport. So, so yes, six, seven, eight out of ten, but we can go, I think, even further and better. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, now, we've got a bit of time uh, for some questions, uh, a, a few from the floor, and also I'm getting some uh, via the Slido uh, machine, and uh, I've got them up here. A lot of the questions, uh, first question is actually about housing, which uh, I'll leave on the pad for Lisa and uh, the uh, second panel, really. But um, uh, who would like to ask a question from the floor? And we'll get a... Um, uh, we've got one here. Somebody over this side. Yes, yeah, somebody here. So uh, a microphone will come to you both. And we, we, what we're going to do is to take the questions t together, one after the other, and then the <coughs> panel will uh, ask them as uh, uh, appropriate. But I'd just like to ask... Uh, Jules, one question from uh, Leo Hammond, who's uh, uh, put the question on Slido, and he says, the current London plan is 430 pages, the new draft plan is 530 pages, and if we want a more accessible planning system, isn't there a case for a more succinct plan? You know, it kept Sadie up at night, so uh, uh, what... what uh, That's because it was so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Sadie. Um, well, well, Nicholas has added a few pages, I think, and, and I think that highlights the issue, really, that um, I would challenge anyone anywhere, not just in this audience, to say, you know, look through the couple of pages of contents at the front, and which policy would you strike out? Uh, and somewhere as complex as uh, London is, with the challenges that we have, with the direction that we all want to take it in for, for the better, um, and what needs to be steered, nudged, changed radically. Um, that, covers, needs, that requires us to cover a lot of ground, and, and I'm not sure what policy I would look at and go, actually, we could, we could do without that, and, and if we let that area slide, you know, it's all right, we've got the other policies. I'm, I think, and the key thing is, is that uh, it was mentioned earlier about prioritisation. It's been deliberately written, so that it has to be taken in the round. Yes, that makes life a bit more difficult for people. They've got to read the whole thing. Um, but we've deliberately have not prioritised uh, things. But there's quite a lot of repetition, isn't there? You have a policy box, and then you have uh, uh, an essay about it as, as well. The, the justificatory text that follows each policy to explain why and to give some indication of how we think this, uh, this policy, policy should be uh, taken forward. Um, but one thing we didn't do was repeat 
sections of all the other mayoral strategies that apply. The, the London Plan is only one of seven or eight statutory strategies that the mayor has to produce, and we didn't repeat the, uh, the almost equally thick tomes, which are the transport strategy and the environment strategy and, and so on, and, and all those are part and parcel <coughs> of, of, uh, of a framework for London. Thank you very much. Well, we take our questions now. First one there, then second one there. Thank so. you very much. My name is uh, Sue Vincent. I work at Urban Design London, and um, we've held a number of London plan briefings with our members, which are mainly public sector, local authority, and some private sector organisations. Very much welcome the London plan's focus on design and the design chapter all of its own. And the fact that it puts transport and connectivity at the heart uh, of planning for good growth. We also recognise that the plan is driven by housing numbers and I guess the concern is that we, to make London more developable, we, we must ensure we don't lose out on the quality uh, just for the, for the quantity of numbers of units and I certainly take the point that was raised earlier that we're talking about homes here. The concerns that members raised was that the design policy chapter is silent on refusing poor design and what actually does make good design. So where is the teeth in that <coughs> policy? So the question, do you think that clarity in what will and will not be acceptable for good design will help you achieve your stated aims of that? Very good. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, Sadie, perhaps I can come to you. You are a Mayor's Design Advocate and uh, also uh, I work, uh, do quite a lot of design review for HS2 and so on. So uh, encouraging design quality rather than refusing it. How do you think the London plan should respond to that? I think um, one of the things that you can do to encourage good design is show what you, you know, what you mean by that and not just write what you mean by that. So for instance, uh, we've been encouraging uh, those people, uh, we've been encouraging High Speed 2 for instance to uh, put forward specimen designs for uh, particular um, important parts of, 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 of the infrastructure. So the Cone Valley Viaduct, for instance, um, Martin Knight has done an extraordinarily good job of a specimen design throughout the process, uh, has consulted with you know, local stakeholders, has a design that's been brought into uh, that the design panel thinks is you know, really good. And, uh, and, the, and that's with, with, we're kind of forcing developers uh, and the and uh, and the civil civils contractors to um, to deliver something of equal quality. So I think that it's I, I'm quite I think the number of design panels that are emerging, the focus on design. I think it's fantastic that the mayor is taking it so seriously. I am pushing hard at the National Infrastructure Commission to make sure all. Uh, infrastructure of national significance has design at its heart. So I think there's a, there's a number of us working hard to make sure design is being taken seriously. And I think it's more carrot than stick. I mean, it's a little bit of both, uh, but I think we, we have to kind of, we just have to raise the bar. We have to show people what it, what it should be, look, what it should look like, not just, you know, not just in text, but, you know, in, in Any, reality. Anyone else like to respond to that? Yes, partly agreement, maybe, maybe partly disagreeing, not sure. I mean, we also worry about good design as a phrase, not that it shouldn't be used, but you know, what, what, what the hell does that mean? Um, without pictures, I think it's very hard to, 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 to get anywhere. Um, I think we, we prefer the use, I and mean, not everyone in the room will agree with me on this, we prefer the phrase popular design, not good design, because to some degree you can measure that. Um, and we, we like numbers as well. So when we get into working on streetscapes with communities or with landowners, we get into the ratio between the height of the street and the width of the street between the fenestration pattern and all the materials. So I'd say less would be more. And if we could get into the details or set the framework to get into the details for ratios, images, materials, then you could get to clarity more quickly. Very good. Jules, you wanted to? Uh, yes, I mean, what, one of the things that we'll be bringing forward to, to aid that, those decisions will be the uh, housing design guide. Um, and that will go further than simply uh, sort of domestic housing typology. It will be uh, about the surrounding streetscape, the fact that so many of the, the, the density developments that will come forward uh, would have active ground floors. We want to uh, uh, explore and give guidance on how that can be done well, how you can live side by side with um, you know, creative maker space, uh, and how neighbourhoods can be uh, built out and well designed 
in the sense that was mentioned earlier about problem solving and uh, problem avoiding uh, in, their, in, 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 their, in their design. And it goes far more, uh, far further than, uh, than simply uh, aesthetics. Um, I think perhaps we have to s uh, stop thinking of design actually as far more than something you assess or judge after the event. I think it's going to increasingly have to become a tool by which um, uh, not only um, uh, communities one round through co-design, but actually possibly a, a mechanism by which land is released. And by that I mean, I think, I think something like neighborhood planning, neighborhood co-design is actually gonna have to be used in the suburbs if you want people to give up their semi-detached or detached houses um, to create where it's appropriate on transport modes, something altogether more appropriate and London-like. And I think it's got to be a combination um, of absolutely community involvement and also, quite frankly, appealing to uh, individual landowners' self-interest in, in order to release the land. Because I come back to my, my point that actually, unless we find new mechanisms and uh, new players here, uh, you know, I'm not going to knock the, the respective <coughs> house builders because goodness knows they're the only show in town at the moment. But we've got to find alternative ways of delivering uh, not just the housing but all the other commercial and neighbourhood uses we want. So I think n design could become quite a pivotal part of early in the process rather than just seeing it as a review mechanism. Mm -hmm. Very good. Michael. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about placemaking, placemaking the last of design <coughs> of British land, if you like. And I think critical to that is community engagement. And our Canada Water Master Plan, I think, is a, a good example of that. One of the things we're particularly focused on is not just the design of the buildings themselves, but the public realm and the places between the buildings and what that gives back to the community. I think that's incredibly important. Thank you very much. Now, we had a question. There was a question in the middle here. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, Rosalind Redhead from Campaign for Better Transport London. Um, the Evening Standard came out with a headline that the, the London plan wanted to ban parking spaces um, from London homes and offices, which is great. I mean, there are 6.8 million parking spaces in London, which take up a minimum, absolute minimum, of 75.8 kilometers square. That is a lot of space. So obviously, Taking out um, car parking spaces, um, the mayor says he wants to reduce. Can I ask you to put your question, please? You, so that yeah. we, uh, can well, uh, what I wanted to say is, how can we justify putting any car parking spaces into residential dwellings? Um, 0.2.5 um, to 1.5 per unit in inner London to outer London. Central London is car free, but I don't think we can justify any new car parking spaces. In right. fact, I think we okay. need year on year let, reduction. Let, let's ask Jules to respond to that one because we should go to our vote in a moment. There are different places, with different places within London. It is um, a, a collection of villages, although now densely packed together, and those villages out on the fringes of London do have different transport needs to inner London. We have the luxury where we are now, if one lives in zone one and zone two, to have very p p high PTAL ratings. Some town centres do <coughs> in outer London, and those are the places that we would be looking to for uh, practically car-free development, or if not car-free development, um, and to, to densify. But those places of, sort of zero to one PTAL rating, um, it's just simply impractical to, uh, to, to to forbid any any new car uh, car spaces within within those residential developments. Uh, we, we, we have we have got a, a vote on that in a moment, so we'll see whether everyone uh, agrees with you. So we're going to uh, go to our voting now. And we've got uh, three questions, and you've got 40 seconds to uh, push your buttons on each one. And uh, the first one is. Uh, is the removal of the density matrix the right approach to achieve optimal density throughout London? 
Um, and you've got uh, various options there. Yes, it will encourage higher densities in appropriate locations. Yes, however, I have concerns about the implementation. No, it will lead to confusion. The density matrix was a good guidance. No, it is a bad proposal and will lead to overdevelopment. So uh, please vote on that. And as I say, 40 seconds to go. This is a more complex answer than the previous ones you've had, so it's taking a little bit longer to uh, come through. <laughs> but uh, I hope everyone has read the uh, new higher density uh, paragraphs in the draft plan. It's a test whether you read it. Indeed it is. Right, well, it seems to be... Th we've had our 40 seconds now, I think, haven't we? They should be coming. <laughs> right, so, well, there we have it. Um, yes, yeah, so half the people uh, have concerns about its implementation, but think it's, uh, uh, their response is positive. Uh, nearly 30% uh, also positive and think it uh, will encourage higher densities in the right uh, locations. And uh, so 14 and 8% of people are, are no's. So uh, that's an interesting uh, response. So uh, the second one is, do you agree with the introduction of the agent of change principle in the London plan? Oh, God, this is a pretty <laughs> speedy answer here. Mitigate impacts on new developments to existing businesses, such as music venues, bars, and pubs. So, gosh, well, right. Still, the no's are going, and they're going up again. Right, I think that looks like a pretty convincing win for agent of change. Um, right, now we move on to uh, question three. Do you support... Sorry, wait for this to change on the screen. Uh, do you support... Right, we seem to have moved on to the wrong page here. These are... Right, do you support the new... Proposed policies for reducing London's reliance on cars is a question you heard uh, a moment earlier. By making new developments free of car parking, that's in uh, the cars in high p rated areas and in London uh, will have uh, zero car parking. Is that a good thing or no? I should say, Peter, as well, that the out of London has gone down as well. So it's across the board, across London is reduced. But in central, in the cars, it's zero. Well, again, uh, that's a uh, pretty convincing uh, yes there. So it seems like key policies, Jules, you're getting a lot of support here. So uh, um, uh, this is a really good thing because it means gives you a little bit more uh, elbow room, doesn't it, to get them through. So, um, well, that, that, that's splendid. Excellent response, everyone. I think that's great. And uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, this panel for... Um, their, their comments and thank you Jules for introducing it and now I'm going to hand over to Lisa Taylor and she will introduce her panel. Thank you very much. Our panel is taking a seat. Uh, good to see you all. Great crowd. I love the fact that planning the first part gets to do all the sort of great aspirations and questions. And then when housing happens, it's kind of where the rubber hits the road. We start talking about delivery, the fun part. Um, what we're going to do with this panel, which has, we're almost all scooping now, we're about there. Um, this panel tonight is great. We have Deputy Mayor James Murray for Housing and Residential Development. We have Liz Peace, who's Chair of Old Oak Park Royal Development Corporation and Centre for London. We've got Ben Derbyshire, who's Chair of HTA Design and also current President of RIBA. 
Joan Agrini, who's chief exec at Croydon and was at Newham, so she knows inner and outer London. Um, and then we've got Claire Benny, another. We have our own mayor's design advocate, I would note. Um, I think every, every panel may have a design advocate. She is uh, founder principal of um, municipal and also former development director of Peabody. So there's a lot of experience on this panel. And what I liked about seeing their notes was that they're here to possibly champion the plan, but also to challenge parts of it in an effort to make it better. And I think that's what I'm keen on hearing tonight from these guys and potentially from the audience. I've seen some good questions coming through. Uh, it's what Future of London's about. It's what this whole event is about, is challenging and finding solutions to make things go a little bit better. With that, I'm going to hand over to James Murray, who'll give us an opening statement, and then we'll go from there. James. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, when Jules opened uh, this evening, he started with a series of uh, provocative statements um, and I thought, in fact, uh, the response to the question earlier about 65,000 homes was a pretty provocative response from the audience, if you don't mind my saying. 96% are going one way. Uh, I'm really interested in speaking to the 4% afterward, though, and see uh, <laughs> some of the ideas they might have. But, but in all seriousness, I think it's quite important to step back and consider the, uh, the importance and the context of that 65,000 home figure in the draft London plan, because what it says is that it is possible in London to build the homes that we need. Um, and I think, in a way, that's a really important place to start because sometimes tackling the housing crisis, we sometimes think how insurmountable it is and how any efforts uh, will only make a marginal difference. But what the London plan in draft says is that it is possible to build the homes uh, that we need. If we were to build at 65,000 homes a year, we could build the homes we need without, by the way, building on the green belt. Uh, we'll get to the delivery in a second, but I think for the really important starting point, it says it is in theory possible. And that challenges us in certain key ways. It challenges us to ask some questions around density, um, around small sites, uh, around co-location. Um, a lot of the topics which have been discussed in the previous panel, and I'm sure we'll pick on, up on too. But it means that those questions uh, can't be pushed aside, far from it, they're put center stage. And so questions about optimizing density with our housing design guide, around design codes for small sites, around how to make co-location work through great examples of how that can work in practice, um, suddenly become absolutely essential. Um, and I think then to move on to the question around um, delivery, uh, what I will put out there is my way of thinking about the role that the draft London plan plays, which is it sets out how we can go as far as we can, we collectively, city hall, councils, developers, housing associations, designers, architects, and so on, how we can go as far as we can using the powers and resources we have, and then make sure that we as Londoners have unified asks of government for what further we need to support greater delivery. So I'll give you a few examples of our approach. Uh, affordable housing. Affordable housing, genuinely affordable homes, um, is the mayor's top priority. And so in the draft London plan, we have the threshold approach, which I'm sure many people in this room will understand and, and, and know well, whereby 35% or 50% on affordable housing enables quicker uh, planning permission. We want to use that to make sure the planning system is delivering as much genuinely affordable housing as possible. We want that to work with the investment that we secured from government, but we're really clear that we need more investment and we need more investment in housing infrastructure to support those homes being delivered. Secondly, in terms of land, we all know and I know from conversations I have that we can talk about planning and finance and all the other barriers to housing delivery. Uh, most roads lead to land, uh, which is where a lot of the conversations end up. And so we in City Hall recognize we need to play a more active, more muscular, more interventionist role bringing land forward, uh, which is why we're hiring more people at the moment to expand our Homes for Londoners team. It's why we have a revolving fund, a 250 million pound additional fund to buy more land to bring that forward for housing, but again, we need to go further. And that's why it's very welcome to see some cross-party consensus at a national level that the land market needs to be addressed, something we've been arguing for and will continue to encourage. And then thirdly, models of delivery. Uh, we recognize that the home builders at the moment, the volume home builders, play a really essential role in building homes, uh, but they on their own cannot scale up to build all the homes that we need. They need to be complemented by build-to-rent providers, by housing associations and by councils playing a really crucial role building homes directly. So to sum it up before I hit my time limit and get a red light, at the centre from my point of view of Sadiq's draft London plan is a commitment to building those genuinely affordable homes 
And I think it's incumbent on us to set out the blueprint of how that could be achieved, to go as far as we can with the powers and resources we have, and thereby earn the right to ask for more. Thank you. Thanks, James. I think that's a brilliant start. Um, we'll go to the panel now, and one of the arguments for uh, reaching the numbers that we're supposed to need is that we have to use large sites. It's all about scale. You'll hear about small and large. But Liz, first of all, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities for developing on opportunity areas in some of the larger sites we have? Right. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Well, um, obviously what I'm going to say is going to have quite sort of strong uh, reference to Old Oak and Park Royal, where I'm... Uh, uh, have the privilege of being the chair, but I think a lot of the comments also apply to uh, the, the broader opportunity areas. Let's look at it in two halves. What are the opportunities and what are the challenges? You'd hope there were some opportunities because they're called opportunity areas, so um, it would be a bit of a misnomer if they weren't. Uh, the first thing an opportunity area gives you is scale. And, and certainly if you look at something like Old Oak and Park Royal, we have, we have huge potential capacity. I don't believe we're going to make a dent in housing numbers without uh, looking at scale. You're going to hear some of my, my fellow panellists talk about small sites and how valuable small sites are. Yeah, yeah, very good, but I don't think you're going to crack this. <laughs> so that's just throwing the challenge down the road. <laughs> um, so, so your opportunity area gives you an opportunity to, to think big, to, to build big in numerical terms. I think it also gives you a focus for planning and funding, and I think mayoral development corporations have a, an added advantage here. If you like, it also gives you, it gives you a brand. It gives you something to sell uh, to potential investors, a way of sort of getting them excited. You, you've got your plan for the area. You've got not necessarily glossy brochures, but you can, you can show people what your big vision for a particular area is. And, and one of the other big opportunities, and I, I see this very much in, in Old Oak, uh, is the opportunity to do it from scratch, to create a really um, impressive, new, sustainable place, to achieve some of the changes that actually Jules was talking about, the modal shift, perhaps a car-free community, an energy-efficient community, uh, a green community. You've got the space, you can do it. Those are the opportunities, the challenges. Well, um, I think probably every single opportunity area would be classed as a brownfield site. I'm almost certain there mm. probably aren't any that aren't. I can tell you Park Royal's a pretty brownfield uh, site, so it's not easy to develop. Brown, brownfield sites have always got problems, they've always got challenges, they're always expensive. And, of course, they always need masses of infrastructure. I can't believe how many bridges and tunnels and things Old Oak needs, and I can't believe how expensive bridges are. That's uh, um, uh, um, almost unbelievable. But the infrastructure need uh, is huge, and that means you've got to actually find some way of funding it. And you've either got to um, you know, beg uh, subsidy from central government, you've got to beg funds from um, local government, or you've got to find the development community to help you. Those are all big, big challenges. Um, my next one is the whole issue around affordable housing, connected with the infrastructure, because if you are expecting your developers uh, to help pay for your infrastructure, they're going to be difficult, or it's going to be difficult for them to pay for affordable housing. I've been told I've had my time. I ought to stop. I would have mentioned the challenge of design quality versus density. Uh, and then, of course, and let's never forget, uh, the challenge of needing to accommodate existing communities. You cannot ride roughshod over people who are already in these areas. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, there was a nice handoff to Ben, um, who's been asked as president of RIBA to sort of handle the design question. Um, how do you actually maintain design quality after you get through the planning? Um, what, what are the options you have? Well, we liked um, a city for all Londoners at the RIBA very much. We liked it because it was um, uh, so inclusive in the use of the words in its title. Um, and we uh, are very uh, supportive of good growth and green growth, uh, the implication of uh, quality, and uh, that um, when it comes to uh, the delivery, design was kind of written in as a requirement on every single page. Um, so there are a load of extremely um, promising design provisions in the draft plan. I want to just focus on two in particular because I think there are two that where we're going to need further and we're going to need to go further and we need to work hard on the implementation. Um, the first is design continuity, which we, we really welcome at the, at the RIBA and I hope the architect in the, the room will too. Um, uh, what it's all about, of course, is uh, design and build. 
Um, and I think design and build, especially in the world, world, world of housing, um, has <coughs> essentially generated, um, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say, a crisis in quality. Um, it was designed in order to lay off capital cost risk. Um, all it's done I is uh, create all kinds of unintended uh, risks through the life um, of a building. Um, we think we have to completely change the culture of procurement, both in the GLA and in the industry as a whole. And in the RIBA, we're working with the Chartered Institute of Builders and the RICS, because what we will need um, is a completely new culture in order to deliver. Um, and so it's, it's a procurement guide um, for those who insist on retaining the qualities uh, such as they are of design and build, who want to deliver um, quality outcomes um, as a consequence of that process. The second thing, I, and I'm really pleased to see the 86% in favor of suburban densification um, and um, you know, the idea of the big small, if you might call it that, Liz, um, because I, I do think um, there is a huge opportunity for us to create um, a wonderful new vision for our um, suburban uh, neighborhoods, in fact, the 20 outer London boroughs. Um, some of them uh, are thriving, many are not. Many are pretty subtopian in, their, uh, uh, in the, the way they deliver um, well-being for their occupants. Um, so we think there's a huge opportunity there and we were completely um, uh, amazed actually by the degree to which just about every single aspect that's necessary to deliver the superbia idea uh, of which you may have heard, hashtag superbia, look it up. Um, <laughs> but what it, what it amounts to, and this was work with uh, Yolanda Barnes of Savills, um, is the incentive of 100 to 200,000 pounds per plot, which would turn um, NIMBYs into YIMBYs um, in uh, the outer London uh, boroughs. And what it requires is all written into the plan. Local development orders, master plans, design codes, um, plot passports, um, uh, neighborhood planning, it's all there. But we will need two things in order to deliver on that. Um, firstly, um, a pilot, and secondly, much more in the way of local authority resource. Thank you, Ben. That was a little plug in there for Superbia. I will get the spelling to you afterwards. Um, <laughs> Joe, I'm assuming he wasn't talking about Subtopian when he was referring to Croydon, because uh, you guys are doing all kinds of fascinating things. Um, you're leading on small sites, uh, certainly in terms of outer London. How is it going? I mean, we're talking about delivery here. What can you share that will help with the London plan? Well, firstly, um, thanks a lot for inviting us today. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it's a fan well, from, from Croydon's point of view, I am going to be slightly parochial about this and come very much from an outer London Croydon point of view on this. Um, you can't argue with the plan. All of the key principles are the right principles to grow the city. Um, the key issue for us as local authorities, particularly local authorities in outer London, is how we're going to deliver it and who's going to pay for it. And I think um, when we're thinking about good growth, I guess I'm, I've been thinking about who are we actually talking about? Who are the people we are, we are growing the city for? And in outer London, it's very different from inner London. Outer London, there's a lot of poverty being exported out into our areas, and we're getting lots of new populations. We are an opportunity area, not brownfield in Croydon. Um, so we have an op we're very fortunate in that we have an opportunity here in the center of Croydon, but also we have suburbs. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about what kind of housing we need, we need, we need a very high proportion of affordable housing to deal with our housing demands within Croydon. Every night I come down from my seventh floor of my council building and there are whole families just waiting to be housed. That's the reality of what we're talking about and who we need to be growing the city for. So the whole issue of affordability is absolutely key to us. There's an also an, an issue with, I think, with the plan in that I think it, it treats the whole of London as one place. And as an outer London borough, we're really glad it's one city, but the land values are not that of one city and the land values are certainly not the same in Croydon as they are in uh, the city of London. And I think it really poses some really key challenges for us about viability. I don't want to get in the big viability thing, but I think it does provide some huge challenges for us. I'll come to the opportunities around that, but I think you know, it has to be recognised that to make things stack up, volume particularly, we know in the centre of Croydon, it's very hard to make big developments stack up with the values that we have and get all the types of infrastructure we need through uh, obligations that we're looking to developers for. 
So I think, you know, the volume sites are important, but we have got a very um, a key small sites program delivered by our uh, development company, which is 100% shareholding of the councils, with 100% shareholder brick by brick. Uh, we're operating across 80 sites, 2,000 units. It can be done. We gr use great designers. Um, but I tell you what, if you think that small sites is easier than large-scale regeneration, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> um, because I think in terms of trying to get, you know, there's a very different kind of argument with residents when you say, uh, we're not displacing you, we're not moving you. But you know that nice bit of grand space which you, where you used to take your dog or where you used to lock up your stuff in your garage? They're going and we're going to be building homes. So it's very emotional and it's very, you know, people are very passionate about their space. And I think, you know, from our side, you know, we are trying to do everything we can. We can get affordable across the board. We can get 40 to 50% affordable across all of our 2,000 units. Uh, but that's because it's our land, mm. it's public land, and we can, we can uh, arrange all of that um, ourselves and be, we can pull all that stuff together. Uh, we've also got our own infrastructure through our growth zone, which is a TIF, a Tax Incremental Finance Initiative in the Centre of Croydon. So you can raise your own money to create the infrastructure you need for the growth. But I think from my point of, bit, point of view, you need four key things. One, local authorities are key in this particular out of London local authorities, and I think more collaboration needs to happen between local authorities to make things stack up. We should start thinking about working outside of borough boundaries. Uh, the second thing is we've got to do something about land banking. Um, absolutely key sites in the centre of Croydon getting stuck, and every now and again they put a little, you know, a digger in, do a bit of digging, saying they're implementing their consent but nothing's really happening. So I think we need legislation around that. Joe, I'm getting the fairness look from Ben. I know. Um, <laughs> so we, we need to be doing something about the infrastructure. The final point for me is we need to be having a proper conversation with people of London about growth. And we're not having that, which means that everybody's got their own battlefield and their individual boroughs. So I think there is an issue for us about how we have that conversation. We've got to grow the city. Let's talk to people about the best way of doing that and actually make the plan a, a plan that people can feel part of. Sorry, I overran. <laughs> well, he's actually more draconian than I am. So, um, Claire, we're going to close with you. The question the NLA had for you was that the plan proposes the 35% threshold, 50% uh, target for affordable housing to increase supply. And we're wondering if that was too vulnerable for the market. Now, now, Joe's just brought up the point of they can do what they're doing because they have their own land. So how do you, how do you, where do you want to take that? Okay, um, I'm going to start by stating the bleeding obvious, which is that uh, we need more homes built, more affordable homes built, and they've got to look great now and forever. How do you write a policy uh, for 500 pages which achieves those three aims? It's blooming difficult, I can tell you, uh, and I haven't even tried, but I can tell through reading it that it is. Um, so you've got to decide where to give freedom and where to give constraints and clarity. So I'm just going to quickly talk about... Uh, the freedoms and constraints that I think work in the document and the ones that perhaps don't. Um, just quickly, a freedom I like, uh, tenure mix on different sites has to be different. I'm sure there's many developers in the room who've got fed up with delivering uh, naught to four bedrooms on every single site, and that appears to be relaxed, and I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, a freedom I'm not sure about. I'm going to wade into the density debate now very quickly. Uh, I live on an estate where 250 homes replaced three. Uh, that was in 1936, um, but I think we can do it now, and I think density is a fantastic thing. But, and this is a massive but, it has to be the most fantastic design ever. And I think the loss of the density matrix is problematic because people basically, and I've seen it in design review in Kingston and other places, they just come in going, we're going to do a massive density now and you have to accept it. Design review is now absolutely critical to achieving quality in density. I think this is where Joe's let the public sector do it really well and demonstrate it thing really comes into play because they've got that chance to say, uh, let's actually choose developers, only developers who can do high density well can do it. Uh, and I think there's a space standards thing here as well. Of course, we've got space standards in the London plan, but actually, again, you constrain the best. And we all know some famous 
uh, deliverers who are delivering very small homes, but they're incredibly perfectly formed. Can we have a list, a register of people that can do fantastic high density and fantastic homes with small space standards? That way, uh, nobody gets to do ridiculous uh, space standards and densities if they can't do it. So don't just tr fast track the affordability, fast track quality as well. So constraints are like 35% uh, and 50% affordable, great. Everybody needs certainty, simplicity, everybody loves a number. The policy then goes on to get more complex. I would try and uh, thin it out and make it much simpler. All developers want is simplicity, and we don't know what effects it's going to have. How do you deliver affordable housing? Uh, frankly, for me, with subsidy or with free and discounted land and with totally transparent viabilities. Um, it is, uh, all I know is delivery absolutely rockets when there's a clear and substantial gap funding pot available. I know it's really cheap to sit here and go, can we have some more money please? But there is money locked up in land in London and it must, must be able to be used to do that gap funding. By the way, 4,500 a year, social rent homes are being sold right to buy. The mayor can't do anything about that, but please can somebody. Um, I'm being told to stop, so I'm gonna make two more points. Um, my overarching comment is on policy H1. How and where are we going to deliver this stuff? Look, planning's fine, uh, but it's much weaker than the powers available through public uh, sector land control. Great growth needs great leadership. We've got one here. We've probably got a few more in the room, but actually the only way you're going to get loads of delivery and loads of affordable housing and really high quality is if people in the top of public sector organizations uh, lead uh, and understand technically how, you're, how they're going to get all the boring stuff like procurement and everything, doing it properly so that we actually get the homes we need. And I'll, my final point is that uh, this is so dull, but tax is the major problem. We can only get affordable housing when we stop landowners taking all the value out, yeah. and tax is crucial uh, if we're to house all Londoners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Slightly cheeky towards the end, but there we go. We'll take your questions in a sec. Can we get a couple of hands up? We've got uh, one gentleman over here and one lady over here, so one there and one there. And we'll start with two. Um, while you're getting the microphones to you, a question that's come up online from one of you, and also uh, Claire had it as well, is what about the potential to pre-approve uh, standardized block design or standardized housing as a way to uh, produce more affordable at pace in time? Any thoughts about standardized housing design? Ben, you just perked up there. Uh, well, I, the, the, sorry about the plug, and it's two used, by the way, superbia, um, uh, relies totally on the idea of, of uh, what you might call a plot passport. Uh, so the, the local development order would have prescribed uh, building envelopes set out in the, the nature of which would be to ensure um, uh, quality of the outcome and provide a great deal of freedom uh, for small enterprises and uh, groups of home owners or individual ones to um, uh, deliver their dream and add to their family fortunes. Anyone else? Very good. Um, anyone else want to kick in in terms of standardized design for homes? Claire. Very quickly, uh, everybody in here will know that I'm a Peabody nerd, having worked there for 11 years. Uh, that organization spent 20 years with one building and one contractor, bang, 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 in 14 different places in London. There was no such thing as planning then. Uh, a lot of homes got delivered, and they're all pretty much now conservation areas. Uh, what's not to like? <laughs> Anyone else want to tackle that one? James, do you have a thought? Yes. This is about, I mean, two obvious links to stuff that we're keen to promote City Hall, uh, the design code uh, for small sites, uh, which helps to give uh, small home builders greater certainty by de-risking some of the planning uh, elements of the small sites coming forward. I think the design codes are a great opportunity for boroughs to take a lead in saying what kind of developments they want uh, on small sites in their area. Uh, and on the other side of, uh, of, of the equation as well, uh, talking about off-site construction, um, mm -hmm. I think, and the, and the benefits that have working out what the right role is for the public sector to encourage all the innovation in the private sector uh, in off-site construction, making sure the different methodologies are compatible and so on. I think there's a lot to that. We've been hearing people talk about mortgage issues, insurance issues, compatibility, site access. There's so many negatives, but there have got to be a lot more positives to this, so it's worth finding out what they are in terms of off-site. Um, we'll go to the gentleman here. First, we say who you are, where you're from, and phrase it as a question. Thank you very much. My name is Alistair Lenschner from Expedition. There seems to be a general agreement that higher densification in London would be good for developing more homes. 
but to deliver more homes for more people in London. It's not just about how many square meters per hectare you have, but how many people per square meter you have in the house, houses. So the limit to the minimum size of dwelling would seem to be an artificial constraint in that respect. So why don't we have more faith in innovative designers to be able to do compact housing like we see people living in Paris, as long as they have a minimum amenity standard, allow us to get more housing in per people per hectare, not just square meters per hectare. Thank you. We'll take uh, both at a time. So I've got that one noted. Lady over here. Hi. Um, uh, my question is quite... And where are you from? Sorry. My name is Samantha Young, and I'm from the Waterloo Residents Alliance. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we're fighting a company, a non-for-profit company, who owns land in Waterloo and trying to stop them building a nightclub on, ha on land that was earmarked and has a covenant on it for social housing. So how do we as a community continue to fight these people? Because they're getting away with building commercial properties on land they were given for social housing and have been refusing to build it. Okay, thank you. Um, two quite pointed questions. Maybe we'll start with that one. Uh, James, I'm gonna have to go to you with that. Sure. Um, well, I mean, maybe without getting into this, the specifics of your case in front of everyone, but please come and grab me afterwards if you want to talk about uh, what's going on, on there locally. Uh, what I can say more generally is I think that, you know, particularly when there's a lot of building going on in London, um, one really important part of what I want to make sure we focus on is winning Londoners' trust for what's happening. Um, because we can talk about the 65,000 homes a year. If people don't think they're going to be homes which are are going to be affordable, are going to help people, going to improve your neighborhood and so on, uh, you might not support it, you might even oppose it. You know, it's not going to be something you want to go along with. So from my point of view, uh, one of the big things that, that we've uh, focused on is making sure all the viability, all of the financial assessment around what can and can't be built is transparent. And so we say, okay, you bought the land for X, this is actually the value of the land, so this is how much affordable housing you should be providing, making sure that things can't be hidden in opaque viability assessments and so on. Given to them by the GLC in 1986. Why don't you come find him after you've got two deputies let's, here. Let's catch up after <laughs> yeah. about the specifics. But as a general point, I think you're really absolutely right to say we need to work out uh, how to bring Londoners with us as oh. we're doing quite a lot of building. Um, if I just address the, the gentleman's point as well around um, size standards, space standards and so on. You know, I mean, this London plan uh, sets out um, really clear, specific standards around space and about around room sizes. And I think, again, that's really important, actually linking to the point around winning Londoners trust, in that if we're talking of building at higher density, uh, people want to be confident that when we say higher density, we're still protecting, in fact, strengthening the protection for the space standards and the room standards within the individual properties. I think that it is quite important to put your, your question in context, which is that building housing now relieves overcrowding. Yeah, London is an overcrowded city now because there has been success in the last 20 years of creating jobs and a failure of housing to keep pace. Jobs have gone up in the last 20 years by 40%, housing by 15%. That means that people are not, not moving to London, they are moving here. They're just living in more crowded, in more cramped environments. And so a lot of the 65,000 homes we need to build are not just to keep up with population growth, but it's to make sure that we can bring an end to overcrowding by building the homes we need for the people who are here already. I've had eyebrows from Claire, Liz, and Ben, so we'll go in that order. Claire, I just um, can't. Wow, that see was you. quite a feat, then, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and two, two quick things. Um, there were 2.1 people per home in London in 2001. There are now 2.5 people per home. So uh, actually, occupancy has crept up, and that's partly to do with undersupply, but you know, a number of things uh, to do with. Uh, more people basically but the other key point to address is under occupation if you look at the um, I know the stats for England but not for London but I'm sure they're pretty similar if you look at uh, how many spare bedrooms there are there are the same amount of spare bedrooms in England as there are homes so if all of those spare bedrooms were double bedrooms you could literally house uh, the population uh, of England again so there's something about can we uh, really prioritize and one this is one of the things I didn't get to say uh, downsizer homes it's a really patronizing term and I'm sorry if there are older people in the room who hate that term but uh, it is incredibly important that we build wonderful a big two-bed flats for people to move into so that those family homes can be freed up and we can have that quality of life that you're talking about uh, Liz yeah but by the way I was just going to, to totally agree with uh, with what Claire said on that and actually it comes back to the last point you made in your your speech Claire it's about tax 
and why people actually often don't want to move out of their larger homes. They don't want to then pay the SVLT, etc., etc. You know, if you could make it tax advantageous to downsize. But I just wanted to make the point because I, I go and do presentations about old oak, and I, I've been using some sort of some pictures, done, you know, artists' impressions of what it might look like. And I'm telling people it's going to be a fantastic place to be, and they go, "Oh, you must be joking!" You know, not with those sort of great towers and and, and whatever. So, so actually, getting selling the idea of density is is really really important. We we've got to we've got to understand what we mean by it. We've got to understand what we mean by the the provision of of amenity space. Th there is no problem with people living in mansion blocks and tower blocks as long as they've got the spaces outside. If you look at cities like Paris, families live in uh, in mansion blocks, even in sort of high rise, but they've got good amenity outside, and I think that's. That's absolutely crucial, and I need to improve my images of what we're going to do at Old Oak, because that's one of the things I want to focus on. Gotcha. Thanks. Ben? Uh, well, just on that, um, uh, join in and support our uh, promotion of the London Housing Expo, uh, which I first, more, mentioned, more than, more than which I first mentioned in this room la <laughs> this time last year. Absolutely but I just wanted, on, right. the, on, the, on, the, on the question about uh, space standards, I just wanted to make the observation that um, some of the worst overcrowding I've ever seen has been in uh, homes with the highest space standards, one family per bedroom. Um, and uh, that's why I welcome the provisions in the Draft London Plan uh, for planning controls um, which help to support high quality management, uh, because if you don't have that, um, you know, the whole thing can easily run away with you. And the other point is the, the, the worst excesses of, of poor design are actually in those bits which are totally uncontrolled. That is the permitted development. Uh, conversion of uh, mm -hmm. commercial development uh, where we see some really grotesque examples mm -hmm. and of course that's out with the control of the uh, draft mm -hmm. London plan at the moment and we've all got to try and do something about that. Thanks Ben. Joe? Yeah I was just going to pick up on that issue of um, Alistair's point around sp space standards but also Ben's around permitted development. I mean we have some, we've lost about two million square foot of of space within the centre of Croydon to put really really crap permitted development um, and, you know, with, with uh, some units, 13 square metres, so very, very small. Um, so <coughs> the issue for us, though, is <coughs> on our small sites program, though, is you've got to be creative. It can't be too prescriptive because some of the sites are really awkward um, and small. So, you know, in terms of maintaining a kind of minimum standard is really, really important, but you also need to pr give... You know, we've got to, to do this, it is a bit about the big sites, it is about the opportunity areas, but it's about being creative and innovative. We can't do the same things the same <coughs> ways, otherwise it's not going to happen. But then we've got some great kind of examples. Of, well, we've done this in London before, London, says the Australian. Um, yeah, we've all done this before. <laughs> uh, you know, London County Council, um, you know, in terms of Peabody, you know, build, we, we can do this, we can build a lot of homes. And I just think we need to be a little bit more uh, creative about how we work together on that. But again, get back to my last point of what I said. We can't do that in isolation in these auditoriums. You know, we've got to go and talk to communities about taking them on this journey of this transformation of this city. That's why we're getting into a lot of problems at the moment. And I think we need to prioritise that and have that conversation with broader communities about it. Mm -hmm. Which comes back to your point, I think. Um, we're going to go to another vote, so if you haven't already signed up on the slider thing and logged in, please do that now. Um, the questions should be coming up in a second. I, I have them here, uh, but there we are. Okay, so the previous London plans, presumption against development in backyards, or back gardens if you need to be English about it, um, has been dropped by this as another foreigner. Um, is this a good thing that you can now look at developing in back gardens? I know what Ben will vote for. Uh, you have, I think, 30-ish 30, 30 seconds to decide on this. Okay. 25% of London's area is back garden. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying <laughs> that just next to parking. There's a point of order about the question, question may be not being correct. Yes, the just question may that. not be correct. Yeah. Yes. The density in the outer London boroughs is 16 dwellings per hectare. <laughs> Anyone else want to throw in a number there? We have, would you like to compare that with car parking? Feel free. Go ahead. We can do a maths off. All right. Have these starting to come in yet if you've all voted? Watch and see how we're doing. Ah, yes. It is a good thing. All right. Well, good enough. So anyone who has a back garden, put your hand up. 
We're going to put something in there? All right, good. You're up for housing. And you get, what is it, £100,000 from Ben. So that's good. Um, second question we've got, which should be coming up in any second now. There we are. 270,000 homes with planning permission not being built. Should there be more powers to stop land banking? Yeah. There's, I don't know if we need to go online for that, but I know that's a nuanced question for many, but uh, do throw in your answers. I think this one probably won't take terribly long to get through. Um, and then again, what do you do with that afterwards? Liz, this was your special subject, I think, in the Homes for Londoners, wasn't it? Was wh whether it was about land or not land. Uh, yeah, well, it was about it was about land. We didn't we didn't really get onto the land banking. It was where do you find the available land? Who has the land? Which again goes back to is the, it public who has sector? The land? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't actually ask the question of who has the land, but I think we're guessing. All right. Anyone else? I hope all your votes are in. Should be coming in a minute. I'm I'm curious. Anyone want to bet what the numbers are? Yes. Ninety six. Ninety six for yes. Anyone else? Ninety three. Anyone else? Sold. All right, 93. We have any 80s? No. Everyone over 90? All right, good enough. We'll see how you do. There may not be, we could just make one up because there may not be anybody coming through here. Well, does anyone want to make up a number? I think you're, you're, just hold up your phone. There we are. All right, good enough. So what's your number? 93. Okay, so ignore this. Apparently you've all voted 93%. Uh, there should be more powers to stop land banking. Seven percent. That well, there's a lot of questions. Do you want to know who the four percent is? There's a so anyone in the smaller percentage groups, there'll be a little huddle afterwards. <laughs> but Sarah, you get dibs from Waterloo. You get dibs. Um, okay, last question. We got. Oh, that's it. That's all we've got. We have two <laughs> questions, and we're out of here. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel for a really good debate, and thank you for your questions and discussion. <laughs>
to talk about housing. Nikki. Yes, well, OK, I want to say first that the Assembly is going to respond as a whole to this London plan. We have not yet, we're going through the committees, we have not yet got to the point where we can say we have a consensus on this or that. So when it comes to the 66,000, if I'm talking about housing supply, or 65,000 housing need, it's the other way around, sorry, then I, can, I can't speak for the Assembly, but I can speak for me, and I do believe that we can build that amount of housing. There's much to applaud in this plan, particularly the emphasis on much higher targets, a step change in terms of delivering affordable housing. I also think that the, the way, I mean, I want to salute really the attempt that's made in the plan to recalibrate the way London develops. And I would particularly single out the second good growth policy, which says that we must make a better or the best use of land and right through this plan, there are all sorts of creative, imaginative ways of actually getting more land, more space for Londoners and for their housing. We've heard about the car parking. Car parking really eats up housing. There's also um, modular housing has been mentioned, off-site manufactured housing. That could go on very constrained sites. So there are all sorts of ways. The presumption, the big policy, the presumption in favour of small sites is a fantastic opportunity for smaller builders, smaller firms, to actually have a go on these small sites. It's also, alongside the conversions policy, also part of small sites, it's a great way of people being able to live in their local neighbourhood. If you, I mean, 800,000 people, people, households, have two or more bedrooms. Many want to downsize into their communities and can't. First dib should go to local people on that. And then the density and the design policies. Design-led density is overdue and very welcome. But in fact, there's an issue here because a new layer of planning is being given to boroughs from, they've got to do now tall buildings, strategies, they've got to do area design codes, master planning, I could go on. And they will not be able to do that without resources. They just don't have it. Not everyone, and, and also, they, not every borough is able to be a Croydon. I think Croydon is absolutely magnificent. There's also the density framework. Now, I think boroughs would be very helped with the great layer of planning they're being given, which needs more resourcing. And I think the mayor could come in here and step up and add a more strategic layer to resourcing them. But the density matrix, the density framework, which is now being, in this current, um, in the draft London plan, is being removed, I think should be revised. And I think I would recommend we all looked at the Ove Arup paper, which <coughs> was given to the mayor. And in that, it actually shows how you can get a much more sophisticated, but simpler, in a way, density framework, which would help the boroughs without sacrificing character and context. And really, a can manage all those different Londons. London is many Londons. Now, where we do have a consensus, sorry to hit you, we do have a consensus across here, or your mic. My mic. Not your, <laughs> we all have a consensus on one thing, and we know that right now, that we're worried about the strategic housing market assessment, which actually says that only a third of all the 66,000 homes should be family houses. That's three and four bed. And compared with the last strategic housing market assessment, which underpins this plan, this is so different. It actually has double the number of one-bed flats in the social sector. It has treble the number of one-bed flats in the private sector. There's something worrying here. We don't want a trend-led London, and we do want to make sure that people on low incomes can really live in London. They are our lifeblood in terms of functioning of the city. My last point. This plan, last final point, last point. this plan can be, final last point, final. this plan can be delivered, can be delivered, but only if we collaborate with the private sector, we collaborate with communities, and the, most importantly, the three spheres of government work properly together. And that means the mayor stepping up to the plate to help the boroughs, the boroughs stepping up to the plate, and government putting its policies and its money where its mouth is. Last week, Sajid Javid, actually said he's on the side of people who want to move to the southeast. We must supply that demand. Okay, and he talked about active state right. intervention. Enough. Bring it on. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we've heard about housing. This section, isn't, this part of the evening isn't only about housing. Caroline, you're going to talk about green infrastructure and the healthy city, I think. Yes, and that's an awful lot to fit in in uh, three minutes. So yes. I'm just going to say 
one thing about um, greening, and then I'm going to move on to healthy city. So in terms of urban greening, policy G5 is fantastic. It's a really good thing. But we need to know how all these green roofs and um, bits of extra green space that are making up for green land being built over, how those are going to be maintained over time, how we're going to be certain that they are still there. So I think that's a risk and that's something that Jules needs to do some thinking about. Um, uh, I also think in relation to the back garden development, again, that same point applies. There are just too many loopholes at the moment that need to be tidied up in the final version of the plan that make sure that, that, that we're not actually losing uh, green cover. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about is the healthy city. And there is a kind of mission running through the plan around healthy streets, which is something that I think is a good thing. It's about making sure that people can travel, build physical activity into their daily journeys, and that walking, cycling, and public transport are the main ways that people get around in our city, even in outer London. And the um, thing that I want to say, relate that to, is parking and the um, parking po policy that was brought up earlier. Because in outer London, PTAL ratings are the same as, P you know, PTAL 4 in outer London is the same as PTAL 4 in inner London. So there is no reason for um, outer London PTAL 4 to be enabling people to build with half a parking space per unit. Um, we need to rethink that completely, and I hope that is rethought in the next version of the plan. Also, on big developments in outer London, surely we can put in buses and actually put the public transport in so that if you've got a new big development coming, that development doesn't have to be car dependent. And we really need to get that healthy streets thinking properly embedded in these parking standards because it's not there at the moment. Um, and then I have only half a minute left, so I want to talk about air pollution. And um, in particular, um, airports. Um, the plan, uh, one of the first things Sadiq did when he came in was to remove the um, uh, thing that the, obje the GLA's objection to city airport expansion. Uh, we need to have no further expansion. The impact of noise and the pollution and also all the extra people traveling to the airports is having a terrible effect on people's health. And so we need to have no expansion at Heathrow, none at Gatwick, and none at City Airport. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Caroline. And I'm gonna move swiftly on to minimize the uh, time take to Adele, who's going to talk community engagement in planning. Uh, We've had a lot you. about planning this evening, now community engagement in it. Yes, well, absolutely. Uh, many Londoners won't know about or have come across the London Plan, but it shapes their lives on a daily basis. It's one of the most crucial documents for our city, and what it contains shapes how London evolves and develops over coming years. That's what the Mayor actually says at the, uh, in, in his introduction to the London Plan. Um, and actually, for, even for people who do understand it, can engage with it. It's a really tough ask to spend time to get involved and to really dig deep and to, and to get into this uh, plan. I didn't bring mine, Caroline's got hers, uh, which is even bigger than, than the previous London plan. Um, there's an online uh, bit that you can do. You can go in and you do it page by page online, but even that is really quite complicated, even if you know what you're doing. There was a document earlier on, a consultation document uh, called the City for Londoners, uh, which did seem to use a range of methods uh, of, of engaging with people to get their responses. Um, and there did seem to be some, some pretty good ways of doing it in there. Um, and the key issue that came up from that, for the, that was from the annual London survey of 2015, of course, no surprises, the key issue that people raised is about affordability of housing. Um, and to be fair, the plan does seem to have done something to address that. Uh, it's like we now have the different tenures, we now have talk about uh, the private rented sector uh, and all the different levels of, of affordability. Um, but actually, 
I'm not sure that that really is going to solve the problem because uh, viability still is the issue uh, that, will, that will override it. And there are still many authorities who, who already can't achieve uh, what's in their local plans, let alone the London plan, uh, on, the, on the basis of viability. Um, so, you know, it's a real problem whether or not that's going to be able to be delivered. And, you know, that is the key thing that people have raised. In London Borough of Southwark, which is a central London borough, um, we've got very established communities. We've got over 55,000 socially rented homes. Um, and those are the people who are possibly not able to engage with a document like this, uh, but they're the people who are really feeling the brunt of the development and, and of all of the things that are in this plan actually being delivered in their neighbourhoods. Uh, they feel that they're not really getting the benefits, they're losing their light, they're, they're, they're suddenly finding that, they're being, that where they live is being described as an urban context uh, when it comes to loss of daylight and sunlight. Uh, they're losing their affordable shops and cafes, services, local industry, small businesses, all, all going, and they, they're not feeling uh, the benefits that they, that they should be feeling from the redevelopment of the area. And they know it needs to be developed. I mean, we're not talking NIMBYs. Everybody always says people are anti-development and they're NIMBYs. Actually, they're not. But these are established communities, and these are people who can't afford uh, to move locally. Their children can't afford to move locally. And they just don't understand why they have to live with all of this development uh, and, and seemingly no benefit for them. Um, I've just seen the man with the sign come by. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, uh, there is a mention of neighbourhood planning in, in the London plan, but it doesn't really say how, how the London plan is going to support neighbourhood planning and, indeed, how it's going to help communities to compete with what essentially is, is, is big developers. Um, it's, you know, we're in the consultation phase of this plan. The test of whether or not the community engagement has been effective will be whether or not the plan changes as a result of it. But the real test will be whether or not the plan actually delivers a London that meets the aspirations and the needs of both the new and existing diverse communities. Thank you. Great. OK, thank you very much. And uh, last, but as ever, definitely not least, Andrew Foth on densification. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, it's not a war on the suburbs. We're just going to build all the gardens. It's not a war on the suburbs, we're just going to fill it with tower blocks. It's not a war on the suburbs, we're just going to remove family housing and turn it all into one and two bedroom flats. But it's not a war on, on the suburbs. And that revving of tank noises that you can hear in the background, that's just an incidental. Of course it's a war on the suburbs. They've taken the decision that they're going to uh, resolve the problem of the schmar, the 65,000 homes that apparently we require in London every year. And we're going to put that in the boundary of the Greater London Authority, a boundary with, which was thought up and based upon the travel to work area of the 1950s. I mean, how thick can you get? It's a ridiculous bat political boundary. We shouldn't have had it in the first place. And to try and absorb the southeast housing demands on the very small patch of 32 London boroughs is ridiculous. And let's just not, let's also not remember, not, not, not forget that. The problem with the, uh, the, the New London Pan's ab abolition of the density matrix is, of course, that just, that just gives carte blanche to developers to develop even more. Now, it's perhaps because I'm the Tory on the platform that I realise how greedy developers are. You know, I, I quite like greed. I'm a Tory, you know? I think it's a, great, it's a great, great productive instinct to go out and make loads of money. But I know what they're about. I know what developers are about. And if you say to developers, you can build as much as you can on this area, how much are they going to build? Oh, no, I'm only going to build family housing with very, very large rooms. No, of course they're not. They're going to build flats, and we're going to pack them in, and they won't care what they look like. Because one of the other words that doesn't appear in the 750,000 words of the London plan is the word beauty. It uh, does not apply to any, there is not anything in there. It's got no mention whatsoever in the London plan of housing, overcrowding in housing. No mention whatsoever. And this, and this is supposed to be 
an outbreak of peace with the suburbs? No. It's war on the suburbs, as sure as eggs is eggs. What we are seeing here is selling ourselves to the development community, turning our back on Londoners who don't want flats, who don't want tower blocks, and all, even worse, turning your backs on the 360,000 children who are being brought up in overcrowding conditions. This is a war that the suburbs must win. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, that's uh, probably rather against the densification of the suburbs, I'm guessing there, Andrew. Um, now, uh, I'd like to uh, take a couple of... I'll get the microphones to a couple of questioners. So I'd like to see two hands, please, somewhere, anywhere. There must be somebody who wants to take one there. Person in blue here, and get the microphone to there. Let's, while, I, while the microphone's getting us, just let me read some of the questions. I'm not going to get answers to all of these, but some humdingers really here coming in uh, from the audience. Um, do you think, and they're not all directly relevant to the London plan, I guess, but I'm going to read them out anyway. Oh, God. Do you think that balloting residents about estate regeneration will result in more or fewer new affordable homes for London? Is gentr Second question, is gentrification a problem or an opportunity? Um, would a national spatial strategy not be better, a better answer to London's growth demands, which I guess is sort of saying shouldn't there be a way of spreading people out across the country? I think that's what Jane Manning meant. Jane is here. Is that true? What that means? Still here? Yeah, oh, good. Um, and then... Um, yeah, Enough. Right. Let's take... Oh, hello. Uh, Sue Lowenthal... Um, representing Landscape Institute London and um, covering a few of the things we've already talked about. I'm very concerned that the mayor's ambitions to increase green and open space to 50% is going to be lost amongst the um, need for housing and development. And, um, and I'm also concerned that the urban green factor will result in the loss of open space as well because of it, the way it of accessible open green space because of the way it calculates green walls and green roofs, which are great, but I think they might end up in loss of open space. Okay, that's a very clear question. Clearly, there is a tension between the desire to produce a significant amount of extra housing and protecting green land. I'm sure that the uh, mayor and the mayor's office would say this is done, but I want the audience to come back to that one if possible. Anybody else like, yep, another question down here at the front. I'm sorry at the back and the side. I mean, anybody at the back and the side who'd like to ask a question, feel free. Doesn't discriminate. Um, Eleanor Vizzuzzi from the Bartlett School of Planning. Uh, lots of talking about uh, housing and green space and uh, design, but none, very little, apart from a few words now from Councillor Morris about employment, work, industrial land, the places where people work, the high street as a place of work, not just of shopping. So what does this all mean for the London that works? Okay, what's in the plan for the London that works and employment in London? Okay, any third question? I was supposed to do two at a time, and that's two. Right, um, who'd like to pick up the question about the... Caroline, would you like to pick up the question about the... Um, the potential challenge between much more housing and protecting green land in the, in the, green land in the way the question was put. Um, yes, I mean, that's really one of the points I raised uh, when I was speaking, um, in that the, the problem is how do you monitor what happens to these um, green walls and green roofs that get put in to make up for any green land that is lost. And I think you know, that is the thing that needs, something that does need to be addressed in the next draft of the plan, but I don't have anything beyond that to say. Okay. Could I pick up the London that works? You can, very briefly. Yes, the London that works. I think, I think this plan is actually a very brave response to a very hostile climate. You're probably all aware of permitted development rights which are now not just, it means um, a shop, um, a bit of light industry, a warehouse, um, a maker, a mover, a manufacturer, all these premises can be turned into homes overnight. 
And these are substandard house, homes. We've been hearing about them from, from Croydon. And the problem is, we aren't a, we're a city which doesn't just need affordable housing, it needs affordable workspace. And this is really undermining local economies and eventually the whole of London's economy. So what does the plan say? The plan is actually reversing the trend of the past, which was to release industrial land. And it's now saying no net loss of industrial space. And it's looking at clever ways of making sure we get enough industrial space. But it's also looking at workspace in many other developments. So in all sorts of ways, it's trying to make up for this. But in fact, we should really be banging on the door of government to stop this. It really doesn't work in London. And in the end, we won't be an entrepreneurial city. We won't have um, the starter businesses here. They won't have anywhere to move on. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. Adele? Andrew Johnson. Well, Talk I, about I, I need to subject. say that one of the one of the one of the uh, threats of the plan is the removal of protection of, of, of back gardens, and it's those, those back gardens aren't just important to the people who can access them; it's important to the wildlife as well. Um, the London Wildlife Trust reckon we're losing six hectares a year of, of green space on the basis of just building in gardens. They're a very, very important part of the ecological infrastructure, and by allowing development in them willy-nilly, it, it's, it's going to mean we, though that, that wildlife is not going to be able to use the wildlife corridors that are currently available to them, and they are vital. Okay. Gentrification? Go for it sure. Is it a problem or an opportunity? It yeah. ought to be an opportunity. Um, but it, at the moment, it is a bit of a problem because, because it isn't bringing communities with it. You know, London, has, London is a, a buzzing, thriving city, and it has to grow and develop, but it unfortunately isn't growing and developing with our existing communities. And, and so it should be an opportunity, but doesn't feel like it at the moment. Well, I mean, basically, a London plan which doesn't have a solution to the fact that you're going to be shutting Seven Sisters Market and doesn't have a solution to protecting those kind of the, the Latin American community that currently uses that market, and there's nothing in the London plan to solve that issue, and the Mayor for London is going along with the whole idea that that should be closed, well, it just says that, that, that actually... The, the, the protection of communities is really, is really just window dressing because okay. it, it's not real. All right. Uh, briefly. Ballot, ballots, very briefly. I, I think we have to trust and work with communities living on existing estates. There are opportunities on estates to build new homes, but that has to be done with the estate residents. And as a local councillor with, um, with estate sort of densification happening within my ward, what the people who are living there at the moment want is to know that anyone newly coming in, that you're not going to have poor doors, that you're going to have re retain a properly integrated estate, and also that the people who are on the estate at the moment are going to have their homes properly maintained, and that very often isn't happening at the moment. So it is a question of respecting the people living on an estate, listening to them, but people living on estates do understand that we need more homes, and so I think that the ballots should lead to more democracy, more listening, and I hope um, to more homes. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for about one, possibly two quick questions. Here at the front, two, uh, two at the front. I'm sorry about everybody up here, but if you put your hands up earlier, I'd have come to you earlier. So two questions next door to each other on the front row. Oh, my God. Uh, um, uh, Carolyn, you, knew, you stole the words out of my mouth. I, I think there's, it's, it's a nightmare document. It's very big. I can't imagine how the professionals deal with it. But there should be a whole new section that's just called Respect. All this development, it just needs to take more serious consideration. And, and we've heard a little bit of um, talk about protecting employment, but we've heard a lot more about protecting trees and protecting the suburbs and protecting back gardens. We've not talked about the people. Uh, uh, what about London? Uh, it, seriously, what London? All, all that London is, is, is the people, not, not a, a physical thing, it's people. Uh, it needs a bit more respect to the people that are on the ground in the first place. Okay, I think that's perfect, good, yeah. good question. Okay, and the yeah. chap next to you. Yeah, Michael Ball from Waterloo Community Development Group. 
Um, taking up that point a bit further, the, the word communities is used throughout the plan. It's peppered throughout it. But there's no teeth. Where are the teeth for this? Apart from the, the, the ballots for estate regeneration, there's no teeth for communities. Um, and I'll give you an, a, a good example is that developers are required to, do, to, to go through the design process for, for large sites. But they're not, they're asked to consult communities, but they're not required to. How about putting some real requirements there for communities? Communities really know what is needed. And I'll give you, give you two examples. Waterloo Opportunity uh, Area Framework, Communities are very involved with that, and we've got a good product, a very fine-grained, detailed product. Vauxhall, Nine Elms, Battersea, no community was consulted about that, and we've got a disaster. Okay. We really need communities All right. involved. Uh, I thought you might mention Waterloo. I, I, Hang on, before we go on, but just, just put the question back to you for a second. I mean, interestingly, you there mentioned the community and the developers, but didn't mention politicians at all. So is there no role for politicians in development? Or, I mean, why no mention Huge, of politicians? Hugely, huge, hugely. I didn't mention developers either, actually. But, well, but hugely, hugely, uh, there's a role for politicians. And the problem is that they get scared of communities. They, uh, they either get scared of them or they think they know better. There's the, the bizarre conundrum that, that politicians fall into. Now, I hope with our new cadre, you know, I look at James, for example, I, I think there's a, there's a good guy there who understands but we need a lot more of people like that. Okay. The assembly well, members yeah. are all like that, and I, they haven't got any teeth either. So how about giving them some teeth? <laughs> well, I, that's one for the government, who, you know, as ever, the government aren't here tonight. Bless local politicians, both at City Hall and elected members of councillors. They do come to events like this. So, uh, you know, 10 out of 10 for them for coming here to do this. So I'm going to ask each of you now. Yeah. In, I'll do it in reverse order, so don't worry, Andrew. I've got a, actually a question here, if I can just find it. Yeah. Anonymous, I don't know who Anonymous was, obviously, just said, so what would Andrew do to fix the problem without saying what the problem was? So, sorry, Anonymous, I can't ask him to do that, but you can speak anyway. So, uh, I, I think I know what up. he thinks the problem is and uh, set up about 40 garden villages around London in the big pieces of agricultural land that we don't actually use. Um, so, well, uh, I mean uh, that sadly, we, sadly, we've got too many farms. Have you squared that off with the leaders it. of Buckinghamshire, yeah. uh, Kent, and well, Surrey County I Council? Mean, we need if, those farms if we for were food. To do, if we were to do what I suggest, we, we'd, we'd actually have that in the Greater London Area uh, ah. Council anyway. anyway okay. um, yes, I absolutely agree with the point made about people. If planning isn't about people, then what the hell is it about? And we've got to start listening to what people want. So when, we, for example, I asked the mayor of London not so long ago, I said, will you do a survey uh, of, of families in housing to need as to what typology of homes they actually want, i.e. not, you know, whether or not they wanted to choose to live in a tower block or on the ground in a, a, a terrace property. He refused to actually take that up. Now, if the Mayor of London is serious about wanting to know what people want, he's got to ask them. And we have to start asking people, what kind of homes do they want to live in? And you know what? Almost nobody wants to live in a tower block. Almost statistically, nobody wants to live in a tower block. But that is what we're offering. Okay, thanks. Adele, your final thoughts, please. Well, I mean, uh, to, get to follow from that, I would think almost nobody wants to live next door to a tower block either. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's a really a valuable and, and important point. I think, um, I think you know, London has existed for a very, very long time. We've got some very established communities and we've got to start bringing them along with us uh, in all of our planning processes. And at the moment, it really doesn't feel like that. It feels like the developers have the upper hand every time. The viability in the N NPPF really sealed the deal on that, I'm afraid. Um, and we need, to, we need to get control back of our, of our local areas. Caroline, thank you. Good growth. Good growth is about working, if it's going to be properly good, working together as communities, as small businesses, as big businesses, as local authorities, people, you know, people who live in London, working together to tackle some of the really big challenges our city faces, climate change, an aging population, not enough homes, too many people obese because of our transport system that encourages too many people to drive around. If we try, through a mission-based approach, working together, all of us, part of 
the, the, the struggle to get London to a better place, it's only through working together that we're going to actually solve those problems. And, and so it has to be a, a combination of everyone doing it, and then we'll start to see a better city. Okay, thank you. And finally, last word from Nikki. I'll take up two points. One, the community involvement one, community engagement. There's a very nice sentence in the text where it says the mayor definitely wants to hear from people and he wants to make sure that they have an opportunity to express their needs and their desires and also he wants to take advantage of their knowledge and experience. This is all great stuff, but you need it in the policies. And if you care about communities, engagement, not just having a voice, because we know a lot of voices are ignored, but in actually, actually having a proactive role, then it has to be written into the policy boxes. Look under the bit that says strategic areas of regeneration. That's where the 20 most deprived areas in London fit. And yet, there is no policy in that box about community engagement, about the mayor having a role in working with the boroughs, in working with the stakeholders. So I'd end on that because I do think we it's now widely recognized that in fact you can't have, you can't carry on having alienated, disaffected communities. We need people to really get stuck in. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. I'd like to thank my excellent panelists who've been uh, brought sort of lifted the politics a bit at the end of the evening, which is good. Um, I think there is, an, actually, on the uh, questions that have come in here, uh, as well as from the floor, uh, well, they're both from the floor, actually, um, some sort of appeal. I, I look at the deputy mayors here gathered for a user-friendly version of what looks to me a bit like the old A to D uh, telephone book, so perhaps there will be an opportunity for a um, user-friendly uh, version of all of this. Two other points, really. One is that it is intriguing how an event like this tonight has minimally, it has touched on it, but compared with the event that would have taken place on this sort of plan four, eight, 12 years ago plus, much less interest in transport than there used to be. It is intriguing how that subject has slightly disappeared, housing, pollution, the way we live together and so on is now more uh, relevant and visible in public debate. Um, I mentioned politics earlier, there are elections coming up uh, in May and we'll all get a chance, certainly at the borough level, to vote on these kind of issues. I realize the London plan is the mayor's London plan, but a lot of the issues discussed tonight also touch on borough politics, so remember to have your say then. And on the subject of voting, I'm now going to leave with the panel. Peter is going to return to end the evening and to allow, this is probably the nearest we'll get to a second referendum, another attempt to vote, another opportunity to vote on the questions at the start of the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. So just before you uh, slip away, let's just go through some of those questions you answered uh, at the beginning to see if uh, our panellists have convinced you to change your minds about any of them. First one, uh, question one, do you agree uh, with the new London plans focus on densifying the suburbs? And uh, obviously you've heard quite a bit about this, uh, particularly in the last session. So uh, um, how is the voting going there? You've got uh, uh, about 40 seconds to uh, vote and... Uh, so if you would like to uh, respond now, we'll just wait while that comes up. Ah, do we, do we not get a... Right, that's still... The, right, I'm not quite sure what we're happening now. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you can do that, Michael, yes. Right, coming shortly. Right. Somebody? Hmm? Here we go. Right, so uh, that's a... Uh, Mm, only a very slight change from uh, your vote at the beginning was 85 uh, to 15. So uh, 
Uh, Andrew Boff uh, seems to have claimed uh, 2% uh, 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 on, on the arguments about uh, densification of the suburbs. Now, on to uh, question two. Uh, will we realistically deliver 65,000 new homes a year within London's boundaries? Uh, yes or no? And uh, has James Murray convinced you that uh, he can do this? Sorry, James. <laughs> right, so, but more interestingly, a question we didn't answer at the beginning. Can we just go, if not, uh, why? And uh, uh, rate the three uh, most important uh, uh, that, uh, reasons why that might be the case. So here we've got uh, land value is uh, way up front, boroughs lacking funding, planning system and building fast enough, pretty even. And that's interesting, uh, supply chain for construction seems very low compared to the sh changes that are likely to come if we at least get a relatively hard Brexit. Right, so that looks like land is, 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 is the key issue that you've got to deal with there, James, to sort that one out. Um, so, now, next, uh, the Mayor will work uh, with the relevant wider South East partners on strategic infrastructure and housing targets, and do you think this approach would be effective in providing affordable homes for Londoners? And uh, so, on that one, before, 72% of people uh, voted yes and 28% no. Let's see what change we've got now. So... Um, Uh, actually, uh, yes, uh, no has uh, gone down from 28% uh, to 24%. So, uh, uh, so more people are convinced that that, 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 that will work. Um, and now on to question five. Do you think London's population will continue to grow after Brexit? We, we haven't really touched very much on the impact of Brexit this evening, so I'm not quite sure uh, whether that is going to uh, change... Yeah, well, that's pretty much the same as it was before. So uh, not, not, not much uh, change there, really. So uh, um, uh, that, that re really brings us to the end of the proceedings of the evening. I'd just like to say that, uh, uh, you know, for all, all the talk about densification of the suburbs, uh, maybe towards the end we didn't see quite the consensus that James Murray was seeking. Uh, but I'll say to Andrew Boff that actually our research shows that 17% of people actually like living in tall buildings. Um, and, uh, but also I think that uh, maybe he should suggest to his colleagues in Whitehall that regional planning has a real place to play in uh, sorting out some of the issues that he's talking about and that serious consideration is given to reviewing parts of the green belt not fit for purpose. Um, and uh, as to the criticism of uh, no talk about beauty, plenty of talk about design review, which has a critical role to play, I think, in ensuring we create uh, but, uh, more dense places to live that are, uh, but are livable and beautiful. And I'd uh, end with a comment about, Ben mentioned the Housing Expo, which one of the uh, things that actually emerged from last year's debate. Um, he and I and Lisa are uh, pursuing that, supported by uh, uh, James Murray and the GLA generally, to see if we can get some of that off the ground. So hopefully we can. We're still working on it and look forward to you helping us uh, as we go forward. So thank you all for coming tonight. I think really interesting comments from uh, the uh, floor from uh, the platform and also from uh, your vote. So thank you all very much indeed. And uh, you can recommend it to your friends. They'll be able to catch up on YouTube. They can watch it if they want to, or you can watch it again if you like. So uh, um, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. <laughs>